Sound Design. So, Tim, uh, why are you so busy while every other sound engineer in the world is sitting at home sort of twiddling their thumbs? Because I had the uh, random fortune to transition to video before all this happened. <laughs> okay, but a lot of video people are sitting at home too, or yeah. are, are all video people out working right now? I think a lot of people in general are sitting at home, and, and as much as it seems like I'm working all the time, I think I'm working more than some people, but but certainly not at a normal level. I think there is some demand for video, but it varies by client. I think everyone in the world has discovered Zoom and uh, that it's great for some things and it's not great for other things. And I think there's a problem in the industry where, from a client perspective, that there's Zoom and everyone knows what Zoom is and what it does. And then there's, we're going to hire a production company in the studio and do a tech TV show. And people don't kind of don't see that there's a middle ground where maybe we're still using Zoom, maybe we're using some of these other tools, but we're kind of creating a more polished video production. And so I think the problem for a client is they need that middle ground because they don't necessarily have the top tier budget, but Zoom isn't really enough for their needs or isn't really keeping their audience captive. I think even in May, June, we were starting to see Zoom fatigue. I know I'm tired of being on Zoom all day. I, I think there's uh, some audience need for a more engaging production. And there's a client finally sort of recognition that they need that. But I think there's this gap between the Zoom and the big budget studio production where an AV rental company is building a stage in their warehouse. And I think in that middle, there's still a fairly big range. What I have found is a niche of semi-local clients who, to some extent, already knew who I was, who are going, oh my goodness, we need to figure this video thing out. But what I'm doing is not rocket science, and it's not necessarily super technically complex. It's really kind of helping clients find that middle ground. Um, and I say, you know, budget conscious. And these are not clients with no money. These are often clients who are interested in spending money on production. They just don't know how to do that. And so in some ways, uh, I'm serving as much as a consultant and a question answering resource as I am actually providing services. And in fact, some of my clients are just hiring me as a consultant to help them figure out right. how to do these, these things. Because some of these events were already happening anyway. So they already had a budget. Right. But now right. they're quarantined, so they can't happen. So they're trying to figure that out. So it's not that they have zero money; it's that right. they don't know what to do. That isn't like they roll out a broadcast truck or something. to right. do that. And so you know, I have this a fairly wide range of clients from you know small you know nonprofit organizations that are just trying to take their you know training meetings online to electronic music festivals that are reinventing platforms. Okay, I find that really interesting because what I thought we were going to talk about today is basically what minimum hardware and software I need to like set up a rig so I can start doing broadcast services. Mm -hmm. But the question you just raised, I think, is actually more important. So maybe our time would be better spent by just talking through like what do those conversations look mm -hmm. like? Because it's maybe a bad idea to spend any money, make any investment based on assumptions. So instead, maybe we should talk about like how can I be reaching out to people just to have conversations to say, hey, what video or what um, event problems are you having? Do you wish you could get your event online? You know, for me, the work has been coming out of DMs on Facebook or emails or phone calls or even just like somebody posted on Facebook, like I'm trying to figure this out. I comment with a little thing and then, hey, let's chat. And so I'm getting, you know, phone calls from people I went to high school with, right? I mean, just, you know, people coming out of the woodwork saying, I'm trying to figure out this virtual event stuff. Okay. And, and so I'm able to be present and responsive to those questions. And some of that turns into work. Some of it is also just turning into kind of rekindling networks that I had lost touch with. 
Okay, so people that I already know, local people, and just being helpful online. Being helpful, sure. right. And I think, you know, in many ways, for all of the negative things about Facebook in particular, I find Facebook much more useful for this kind of networking than I find LinkedIn to be, because people aren't posing questions to their friends on LinkedIn. They're sort of, myself included, we're sort of all posturing on LinkedIn, like this is my professional <laughs> persona, I'm an expert on everything. Whereas on Facebook, people are much more vulnerable, and they're willing to say, I don't have the answer to this, you know, or I'm trying to figure this out, who can help me? And they're asking for personal recommendations from their friends. So sometimes people are asking for help finding a vendor. Sometimes people are just looking for free advice. But in any of those cases, I can often chime into a conversation and provide valuable insider feedback, even if it's just a few messages back and forth, that in many ways raises my name back into their, you know, forethought when they need these questions kind of answered. And that all sounds good for, for those sound like great things that are a little bit more long-term in terms of like inbound marketing and requests coming in. What about me putting things out? So if I were to look at like my client list mm -hmm. uh, and people connected with events from the last few years and just yeah. start reaching out to them, what are some of the things I can say to them? Like, do I just say, uh, hey, how can I help you with your broadcast or streaming events? Or like, what are some ways to like rekindle, as you mentioned? Those? Yeah, I, I think in some ways, you know, it, it depends on the relationship you have with the clients. But if you're, you know, if these are direct clients that you've had, you know, end clients, I think reaching out and, you know, sort of offering advice or like, you know, a free consult call, you know, just reaching out to folks and saying, hey, lots of people are are working on virtual events and trying to figure this out you know, do you want to just chat for 15 to 30 minutes and, you know, see if I can provide some answers and, okay. yeah, you know, let's don't, chat. let's have a chat, you know, don't make that a hard sell, make it a, you know, tell me what your problems are. Here are some ideas. Here's some ways to make zoom work better for you on your own. But if it's not working, if you need more hands-on support, here's how I can help you. And I think those okay. kinds of, I'm much more into the soft sell, but like, how can I provide value to you always? And then, some of that time you'll give me money for it than I am into the, you know, punitive, I'm not giving you any advice until you give me money kind of thing. Sure. I like that a lot better. So instead of me saying, how can I help you with your live events? I say, Hey, can you help me out by telling me some of the problems or any challenges you've been running into? And, and I think it depends project. on the client, you know, whether you're couching it as let me help you versus can you help me? But I think just, you know, asking clients if, they have time for you know a twenty minute phone call to chat about how they're handling virtual events, and you know making it clear that you're not trying to sell them a specific service. You're just trying to see kind of how they're doing things, and you know if there are ways that you know you can provide advice as much as services. Um, I think is is a useful way to start, particularly for someone who's not been working in video, where maybe you don't have a ton of specific services to offer in terms of video, but you're kind of kind of figure out how you can pivot into video. Talking sure. to past clients about what they're doing and what their problems are is going to give you an idea of what their problems are and how you can solve them. And so once you have a kind of a plan or not a plan, but a, a list of problems and a kind of set of client pain points, you can start figuring out how you as a technician can solve those problems. So, and it sounds like I would just need a couple of examples and those I'm guessing could kind of be from anywhere, but it'd be helpful to say like, yeah, well, this is what a normal Zoom meeting looks like. And this is what, mm -hmm. you know, so, something slightly above that would look like that I can mm -hmm. help. Yeah. And I think, you know, understanding the difference, the difference between a, a, like a Zoom meeting, a Zoom webinar and a, like a broadcast event, you know, like a web live stream event. And, and the differences in aesthetics, in technology, and interactivity is the starting point that before you have these phone calls, you need to really understand yourself so that you can be explaining that to your clients. Because that difference, when we say virtual events, what do we mean by a virtual event? And I think some people mean, you know, just a Zoom call, right? This is just a meeting. That's a virtual, the virtual meeting, it's a virtual event. Some mm -hmm. people mean, oh, this is a, a, you know, Zoom webinar where we've got, you know, some panelists and an audience and that's, that's a virtual event. And some people mean, you know, a polished broadcast production of varying levels, whether that's, 
you know, something that we're, we're doing with a couple of remote guests or whether that's something we're doing in, you know, a studio with, you know, a multicam production and, and, you know, a satellite truck. And I think, you know, in the like services that we as technicians can offer, there is room for providing just support with Zoom. And I think, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, a technician buying a Zoom account and, and sort of reselling that as a service to clients or whether that's a client already has a Zoom account, but they just need like help running the meeting. And so I have some clients where, you know, I'm just using their Zoom account. I'm not selling them any kind of technology solution. I'm, you know, helping them, you know, make their Zoom calls better or their Zoom webinars better, helping them figure out the idiosyncrasies of the technology. And, and sometimes there are clients that are actually very good and already holding Zoom webinars all the time, mm -hmm. but there are just some meetings, some of their events are higher touch. You well, know? Tim, for me, I think this is great. And, and this gives people enough sort of information and motivation to just get started having those conversations because I think you don't need to be an expert in video to get started with this. You, I imagine, are, are some kind of audio or other technician that's been working on events for years. But there's no problem with you going out and having conversations with people about their events and even if you, whatever you don't know, you're just going to write down and you're going to research and you're going to go get answers. And the next time you have that conversation, you'll have that, you'll have that knowledge ready. So I think, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I wanted to kind of get into some of the technology, but I feel like that could be a whole other like one or two hour long. It's a lot. So I think instead, let's just point people to uh, your blog. You've posted um, a few articles recently where you just mentioned some of the technologies that mm -hmm. you've been using. Yeah. So that's a big subject. And then, you know, from there, people could even reach out to you if they, you know. Have yeah, absolutely. You mentioned, you know, people don't need to know everything about video to start in this. And I, I would say what was a big sort of revelation for me when pandemic hit and I'm panicked, like there's no work, like the entire industry has collapsed, you know, and then virtual events, like what does that even mean? And like I do video and events, but it's like, this is a new territory. And I was starting to panic. And then I realized, well, it's new for everyone. Like, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. The world has changed. Nobody is an expert in pandemic response virtual events because it's never <laughs> happened before. And yeah. so, you know, the reality well, is on the ground floor. We're all experts in the things we came into this with expertise in, but everyone is figuring this out as we go because it's new to all of us. And so it's not that you're going head to head with a bunch of people, particularly in a local market that have been doing virtual events forever, because even people who have been doing live streaming and video forever, you know, haven't been doing events at the sort of wide gamut that events happen in the middle of a global pandemic. And so I think knowing how you feel on the webinars that you've attended and the podcast you're listening to and the, all the sorts of virtual, you know, online media that, you already consume, you understand how people consume online media. And so taking those skills and just having the confidence to say, I can figure this out, writing down your notes about what your clients are asking and researching those and being able to come back with answers, you know, and that level of responsiveness makes you, you know, ahead of anybody else in the industry. Sound design. Yeah.